So, um, I think uh, I've seen the second film, and I think you go into the history of Good yes. Reading Breeding a little bit more. Yes. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit, partly because in leading up to this event, I've been talking to my students about today, and um, partly because DePaul now has a lot more students from outside of Chicago, mm. and partly just because of what's happened with Cabrini, mm. there's quite a few people who haven't heard of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a Chicagoan, grew up here, and so I grew up with a very distinct yeah. uh, idea about what C C Cabrini Green was, which I think you you see you show another side of it in your film. Yeah. So I wanted you to talk about a little about what where it came from, what it is, and then I also wanted to hear Dwayne's also a Chicagoan. Um, have you talk about your impressions of Cabrini before this film and after as well? Okay, I think you, for what is Cabrini, you have to go back to 1937 when the Chicago Housing Authority was founded. And one of its missions was to provide affordable um, housing in Chicago, safe and affordable clean housing in Chicago, because at that time a lot of the housing stock was not safe or affordable or clean. And so Cabrini Green was one of the very first housing developments that was created in the 1940s, 42, the low rises were created. And people, when they hear Cabrini, they think of the red brick buildings that you see a lot or were very iconic. So the low rises were two flats and they were called the Francis Cabrini homes. They were built for returning war veterans and their families. And then in the 50s, the red buildings were built, and in the 60s, the white buildings were completed. And that whole unit makes up Cabrini Green, which was on 70 acres of land. It was built with the intention that it would be a mixed income community, and it was very diverse when it was first created. And then what happened in the 60s, Cabrini Green became 99% African American. And in the second film, we do go into sort of the, the rise and fall of Cabrini, w when it was created, and how did it fall apart in the sense of the physical buildings fell apart, how did the crime rise, what, what happened there, what were some of the mechanisms that caused this. And so I think what's important to know, it was, a, it was built as a way, it was built by people who really wanted to improve housing for people. And it was a you know, in my mind, there were just so many factors that contributed to the decline, which is very unfortunate. And Duane, being a Chicagoan, what was your impression of Cabrini just growing up here, and how did that change after working on this oh, film? My impression is that, uh, I mean, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, the far south, and you didn't go to Cabrini Green. That's, you know, it was funny because I had not even <laughs> seen it. I didn't know where, where it was, I just heard about it, and it's like, no, you don't ever want to go there. And then when I started working, you know, as I got older, sure, I, I was able to drive by Cabrini Green and look at everything, and then when I started working with Renit, and getting a sense of the, what the people, yeah. you know, was it kind of changed everything, yeah. you know? It was, uh, at times, kind of disheartening, mm -hmm. you know, to see uh, people displaced mm -hmm. Like that, and again, like last night, I was over, like I was saying, I was over yeah. there in that area, right off of uh, Division Street and uh, Halsted. And I could see Target, and I remember there were buildings there. They're just, it's gone, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of makes you just wonder, where did everybody go, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you said the phrase, you just don't go there, oh, which yeah. I think is a great yeah. genesis into the story of how you started this project. So yeah. that's what you were told as well, being an outsider. So can you tell that story? Yeah, I came to Chicago in 1994 from Canada. Um, I was a graduate student, as I mentioned, in Columbia College. And I had not heard of Cabrini until I came to Chicago. But the first thing I did notice was the segregation. I had come from a city that was segregated by language in Montreal, because you had French and English, but it was not segregated by race. So I was stunned, in a way, at the such explicit segregation of Chicago and the fact that it seemed normal. Like, the, the, at least the people I were right. with weren't talking about it. Like I would, but I was, you know, would ride the train. I was like, how could this be? And of course, one of the first things people said was, here's Cabrini, you're going to pass it on the train when you go to school, but never go there. Right. And all of that just got me thinking, well, what is Cabrini? Why can't I go there? And, and the people, as, as you were saying, they seemed disposable. Here was a group, there were thousands of people. It was a small village living in a housing development that was so 
cut off in some ways. Not that the folks were necessarily cut off, but in terms of how they were viewed by so many people in the city. And yeah. actually in the middle of the city. Well, in the middle of the in city, the exactly, of the city. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and as you said, you know, I was very fortunate in the sense that Mark Pratt, who is in the film, was also a film student at Columbia College. So we met, and he was sort of my entry in. And then the inside was nothing like I had heard of. I and mean, it was so warm and inviting mm -hmm. and such a strong community. And what I found is so many times I think we're all searching for community. You know, this, the phrase I use is it takes a village. And I ask people, you know, when you're in your apartment or your building, how many neighbors do you know? How many neighbors would you go over and borrow, the, you know, the cup of sugar or whatever from? And a lot of people don't know their neighbors. And at Cabrini, <coughs> it was true, everybody knew their neighbors. And that was something that really struck me, that here in this such maligned community was a gem of something that everybody wants, you know? Within this maligned community, there was such a warmth and richness, and it's something that folks who don't live at Cabrini could learn from, yet we're demolishing it. And it, it just seemed very tragic in many ways, and so that's why I wanted to make the film. So since we're at a film school, we'll have a little bit of film school kind of questions. Mm -hmm. For you as a filmmaker, when did you know that your story was there? When did you know, like, this is where I want to really sink in and, and, and explore this community? Um, I think the first time I visited Cabrini, because there's a lot of contradictions at Cabrini, you know? And I'm not trying to uh, downplay the negative things that were there, too, because there were. But it was the contradictions that really drew me in, and, and you could have good and you could have bad in the same sentence. And so I think to make a film, especially to make a film over this length of time, you really have to be invested in an emotional level. So I think the very first time I went in, I knew this is a story that I wanted to be able to tell. So in, in looking at this community, because people told you, told you not mm -hmm. to go there, um, did it change over time for you as well as you it, since you were there for basically mm -hmm. 20 years? I mean, did, did, did your relationship to the place and it to you change in terms of you being invited into the community and you being a part of this place that you, as an outsider, were not a part of? And I think the, the thing about the outsider is very important too. Yeah, I definitely was an outsider and even to the end I'm, I'm an outsider and that's okay. And I think that um, the Cabrini became more familiar to me. I would enjoy going over there. And I remember being in the very last building on the night that it closed. It was 1230 North Berlin. And I felt a, a profound sense of sadness just for the sense of a community was now gone. So it, Cabrini just became, I mean, they, there were uh, parties called Old School Monday, which every Monday people from around the city who used to live at Cabrini would come back. And it was a reunion of sorts. And I do remember just really enjoying, you know, looking forward to going to that. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, obviously some of the themes in the film, we talked about race and class and yes. segregation. And um, in watching the second film, again, the sort of idea of growing up in Chicago, knowing that you're here and hearing stats like it's one of the most segregated mm -hmm. cities in mm -hmm. the country still to this mm -hmm. day. And I think that we don't always ask the question of why that is. And mm -hmm. I think that the film really gets at why that is, mm -hmm. that Cabrini was built as this transitional housing mm -hmm. for people. But the, the white families that moved in were able to move into other communities mm -hmm. when they got money to right. do so, but the families in Cabrini were not allowed to because of segregation. Mm -hmm. So even if they had the financial means to move out, there was no community that would allow them to move into it. And I think that's like hearing that part of the story, just looking back on Cabrini changes, I think a lot of, I, for me, it changed my view of this sort of folklore around mm -hmm. Cabrini and that you don't go there, looking at the history and how people got there and why they were there and mm -hmm. those populations. So can you talk a little bit about that process of just, like you have some wonderful archival footage mm -hmm. of where Cabrini was and how it got to where it is. The process of creating the film or the process of? Um, uh, the process of your discovery mm -hmm. of Cabrini in this way, in this new light mm -hmm. in, while making the film. Yeah, I'm always interested in every city that I live in learning about the history because that makes it, especially housing, it helps you understand where you are today. And there's a really good book I recommend called Making the Second Ghetto. It's by Arnold Hirsch. And he really details the racism that uh, African Americans had to go through in terms of, a lot in terms of housing. There was legal and illegal, legal but I mean, by I mean like laws like say, redlining that were on the books that 
prevented African Americans from moving to other neighborhoods. And then there were also just restrictive covenants where, say, a white neighbor said, we're not going to sell to a black family. You know? And so I really appreciated learning the history of this because then I realized why the city is so segregated and how it's segregated by design. It wasn't accidental that this happened. And I think that it's an important story and I think that's one we wanted to also show that history repeat, repeats itself. That to build Cabrini, it was an Italian and Sicilian neighborhood. And the folks who lived there were all displaced. And we couldn't find any documentation that anybody actually moved into the new um, development, which was Cabrini Green. And so it really, I th I'm a big believer that people need to know their history. Yeah. And they need to understand why things are, are so. And, Another question that the film looks at is who has the right to live in a city and how should they live? You know, what does it mean? And um, just how people of color are treated and not allow or not seen as low income folks of color are not seen as legitimate in a way that because you've lived here and you don't own the place, there's almost like no legitimacy to your history. So um, it was very enlightening for me to read and it just made Chicago make a more sense or understand this is all by design. Mm -hmm. I think for me, one of the the, um, the most engaging parts mm -hmm. of the film is the getting into the personal stories. Yeah. So especially like of Mr. Robbins, mm -hmm. the, the barber, mm -hmm. and, and that you're there that moment that he gets this registered letter saying that yeah. he had like two weeks. I mean, it was just a crazy short amount yeah. of time mm -hmm. to pack up yeah. his business that he had had for years. Yeah. Um, if, if he's not in the second film. Did, do you have any sort of follow-up stories on him or some of the other people that we see featured in the film that aren't in the second film? Yeah, so George Robbins, he was also, he was a wonderful person and was another way that we were able to get, get into the community or, or he was a bridge because we would just go to his barbershop all the time and that's why we were there when the letter was being delivered. And we'd sit there for hours just chatting or talking sports or whatever and it was really... He facilitated um, building trust between the film crew and I and the community that were there in his uh, barbershop. I did follow up with George. When I first started making the new film, I shot about a few days' worth with George in his new shop. He moved from the Gold Coast to Wicker Park, and I'm happy to say that his clientele came back. He was doing pretty well. And then he retired, but it just... In, in uh, you know, we had about 500 hours of footage, so his story, although I really wanted it in there, it just didn't make the final cut. But I was really happy that his customers did come back, and he, w he did okay economically, and it really made me happy. That's great. Um, since you brought up 500 hours of footage, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about process. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this will be a great segue into Dwayne yeah. as well. So in terms of how much you shot and how you shot and um, was it, how, how big was your crew? Was it mostly just you and one other person, or what was your setup for shooting? So when I made Voices of Cabrini, the crew was myself mostly and Antonio Ferrara, who was a fellow f film student in the Columbia College graduate program. And we would do Cinema Verite, so it would be the two of us going out and shooting footage for hours and hours and hours and coming back with tons and tons and tons of footage. And my method is to transcribe everything. And that's a little crazy, but I'm a fast typist and it just really helps me know what I have. And I try to come back immediately and transcribe it. Otherwise, I'll just put, put it on the shelf or whatever and not go back in there. So uh, always small crews, although there was one time when we had a larger crew because I had just taken like TV production with lighting and you know gels and everything. <laughs> So uh, there was like, I don't know, I think we had like a gaffer and we had everything. It was a very large crew from Columbia. And when we came into the building, the people we were going to film or interview were very nice of them to, to let us in. But then they were like, who, like, it just was almost ridiculous because we were lighting it perfectly for a Hollywood scene. And what we didn't realize is the scene was unfolding. You know, we should have just had our cameras on. That was the scene, you know. The mom was talking to her son, you know, all of that. But by the time we lit everything perfectly and we asked them to sit down, they were very stiff. It's like, yeah, they looked great. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a documentary. <laughs> it's about real life. And real life had just happened. 
So that was a learning experience, and that helped me keep the crew small. In 70 Acres in Chicago, we had a lot of camera people, and the credits are very, very long. And because it was very low budget and um, just hard to, to work with folks. And just everyone's schedule, everyone was so busy. Just always been really lucky to work with great people and it's something that I appreciated. And Catherine Crouch came on board. She, we went to school at Columbia College and she came on board about a few years ago and really helped that. She's the writer, editor. Um, there's so many people that worked in this film. In particular, she was just amazing at looking at all this footage and really helping me shape it into a narrative because you can't do it by yourself. It's, it doesn't happen. So. so how many total hours of footage did you it's shoot? About 500. 500. All of it transcribed. <laughs> uh, we used every kind of camera from uh, high eight to one chip um, digital to three chip di digital. It shot uh, SD four by three, so it's kind of old fashioned, but it's authentic. That's what I like to say. But we were just scrappy, and that's why I really have affinity with students too, because it's, you do what you need to do to get things done, and that's what we did. So, so. when did Dwayne come on board, and how did you guys meet? We met through a mutual friend, and she was like, hey, this is dude, and he's an amazing musician. You got to meet him. And at that point, we needed music for Voices of Cabrini. And it was my first uh, endeavor working with a composer, and it was your first movie, right? right? Yeah, first movie. Yeah, so we hit it off. Yeah. And I remember I remember going over to your studio, and you had like the piano, and yeah. said what we were looking for. Yeah. yeah, so we just started working together. Yeah. And then when she, um, I got a phone call, and she said she's doing the, Follow up. I was happy, <laughs> you know. And so she came over. It was on a Sunday in 2009. Nine, yeah. When we first started talking about Seven Acres yeah, in Chicago, yeah, yeah. and we finished last year. I know, and you were so patient. Yeah. <laughs> you would check in and you'd say, "Is this still happening?" I'm like, "Yeah, we're still we're still yeah. working on it. We're still <laughs> editing because what we we gave you a cut, and then what we got is totally different." Was, right. Yeah. yeah because it was totally we had different. to. We went through a lot of focus groups, and they were like, "Well, this isn't working," or you know. No, but I believed in the project. Yeah. I believed in what she was doing. And even mm -hmm. the footage I saw in 2009, mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Yeah. You know, I was seeing where it's at. And again, it's, a lot of it's different. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, I probably wrote enough music for three or four CDs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, but it was great because, um, I, you know, us collaborating together, mm -hmm. uh, it's just, I was writing some things that I never thought I, you know, yeah. never thought I could do. Yeah. And it, you know, like a, it was one uh, in particular. You had me listen to uh, a track by Moby. Yeah. And you said, you, you know, she picked out the things that she liked, and I was like, okay. And I remember when I finished, I played it. I'm like, I'm going to release this. Yeah, it's really, yeah, yeah. That <laughs> stuff know? is really good. It's and really good. A lot of yeah. the stuff, you know. So it was, I was really happy with that, and we didn't have to do a lot of revisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because we, you know, I, I started to see we were on the same page. Yeah. So as the film progressed, my thing was, okay, how can we make it better? Yeah. You know, how can we make this better? How yeah. can I mix it better? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and push the envelope with it, you know. So I used, uh, one of the things with 70 Acres Chicago that we both agreed on was I want to incorporate live musicians. I felt that looking at some of the footage and the time frame, um, I started thinking of gospel, I started thinking jazz, um, blues, for those time periods and try to incorporate that in mm -hmm. to the film. Yeah. So I knew I needed live musicians to do that. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the budget I paid people to come in and, and do yeah. things yeah. because I wanted it to be the best it could be. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't even about money. Yeah. It's like, you know, she would say, Well, here's some money to do this and I'd pay people to, to play on it. <laughs> you know. Great. Yeah. yeah. So since this was your first film, was the process being a composer different for you, having this this material to bring into your work? I mean, can you talk a little bit about your process in, in coming up with the score? Um, I, you know, I listen to a lot of music. Um, and then coming up with, with this score, um, we took a theme that was in Voices of Cabrini that Renee really liked. She liked all the music, but it was one in particular she, you know, she really liked, and that was the shopping cart scene. She really liked that. We're gonna play it for you guys in a second. So <laughs> what I thought was, okay, since you really like that, I'm gonna create 
that use that theme and use it to really create the structure of the next film. Great. And so that's what I did. That's a perfect cue. We're going to actually um, look at a few of these clips and have these guys talk about um, both how it was used mm -hmm. in the first film and then reused mm -hmm. in the second film with yeah. variation. Yeah, so the clip is going to have the scene back to back. And pay attention to the added instrumentation in the second time you see the clip. Yep, it's okay. the second clip. So we can we can roll this one, guys. Thank you. Tell your grandma. Tell your grandma hello. Hello. All right. Now, all right. See him in the stroke. See him in the stroke. So it's a different key, right? Oh, same key. Same key. Um, hi hat in the back. Gotcha. And then it's a flute that will come in. What happened? What in happened? The green, 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 green is not unique. Is not unique. It is the same, is the old, same saying. old saying. Different for kind African, of mix for African Americans in the city, in the city segregation, segregation has always, has limited, always limited housing, limited choices. housing choices. And then you're going to hear the theme two more times in two different sections of the film. So we can keep rolling the next clip. And this is the opening of the film. So you hear a bass, still with the hi hat, live saxophone, different key. And then we got it one more time, mm -hmm. different key. Okay, that, that's it for the, the clip. Break. So yeah, what I think is incredible is that... Trouble started Oh, we can cut. No trouble right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I think is incredible is that it's a theme you mm -hmm. created, and then we revisited it 15 revisited. years later, which yeah. is, I think, really unique. I don't, I mean, to, to be able to do that, I don't know people who, I'm sure there are, but I'm it's sure there are. pretty yeah. cool that we were able to do that. Yeah, I, I know you always like that. I think yeah. you brought it up. You're like, I want to get this in here some type of way. Mm -hmm. So... You know, when you do a theme, a theme can be, you know, uh, rhythmic, harmonic, or melodic. So you can tap out jingle bells on your leg, and you know that's it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Beethoven's Fifth, da 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 mm -hmm. you know what it is, mm -hmm. you know. So I just, you know, I said, well, maybe now uh, I could bring, you know, that live thing to it. Mm -hmm. So I hired a, a saxophone player, Destiny Pavanko, who I had met a year prior. Um, I told her about the film. I, she probably thought I was pulling her leg or something because, you know, it took time. Yeah. But finally I called her. I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> you know, and she came over and mm -hmm. we laid the sax parts down and then I had her do some outtakes. Mm -hmm. And always get outtakes from your musicians. Yes. Always. Get more than you need because you never know when you're going to need it because the last clip, you called me at the last minute. Like, we're adding this intro. Yeah, we're like, we, need, you, we, we, need, we something. need something. You have it. And I said, I said, I thought, I'm like, I'm going to open it with the saxophone. Yeah. And so when we uh, saw it at the first screenings at the Cisco Theater, she was shocked that I used her parts first. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing you heard, yeah. you know. But I had her just, I'm like, just play for me. I just had her play. And so we actually we used a lot of the, in some of the other scenes, we had a, the sax parts mm -hmm. with just saxophone. Yeah. Uh, but the underlying harmonics behind it were the 
part you just heard, mm -hmm. that theme. Mm -hmm. I just took the piano mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, so Thanks. keep it, make it cohesive, mm -hmm. you know? So this next, the trouble clip. The trouble, trouble started. Clip, yeah. yeah, trouble started. Um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, that this was actually a little bit of trouble for you, you were yes, saying. Yes, so it was trouble. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit yeah. about this one? I was, um, I always work at night for some, like 11 o'clock for me, it's like wake up time until the sun comes up. So I'm always up at night and I was having trouble feeling this particular scene. I was, I had wrote a lot of things, but I didn't feel it. And I always say, if I don't like it, how can somebody else like it? You know, I'm not gonna try to trick anybody. I don't like it, so, you know. So I went upstairs in my place and I started watching uh, that, I think it was on History Channel, Locked Up Abroad. And I was watching it and it came to me like a light bulb. And I ran downstairs and I wrote a sketch and I think I sent it to you. I'm like, what do you think yeah. about these parts? And uh, we actually built a theme on that mm -hmm. because first we had the piano. Yeah. Then in another scene, we I added some more instruments. Yep. And then, then the I think you changed the key, maybe? Yeah, and then I added yeah. some drums yeah. and everything. So that's how this yeah. particular cue came together. And we were mentioning, too, we wanted something that gave a sense of urgency without being heavy handed. And I think it achieves a really nice balance. Yeah. yeah. Could we roll this one? 70s. Steel mills shut, factories and stockyards closed. In Chicago, African Americans suffered disproportionately. That's the At one which was started in the 1970s. Yeah. Rent payments dwindled when Steel residents mills lost shut, their jobs. Factories and stockyards Without closed. rental income, the CHA in lacked Chicago, the funds for routine African Americans maintenance. suffered disproportionately. Buildings were neglected. Tenants fighting At for Cabrini basic Green, services were ignored. Rent payments dwindled when residents lost their jobs. Without rental income, okay, we can pause the for CHA a lacked the funds for And I think that just gives you as another sense Buildings of another theme that, mm -hmm. that was replayed. Tenants fighting for basic right. services were ignored. Tone throughout the film. And the next one we're going to do is the end credits, because the end credits are so hard. The, the music that goes over the end <laughs> theme. Because I, I think our credits are two home. minutes, and you know what? It's like, how do you have a piece that, that wraps up what you're trying to say and leaves people with a impactful? Impact, yeah. In, a lot of impact. So do, this piece I love so much. You want to talk a little bit about yeah, this, how it came to be? Yeah, the end piece, uh, yeah. again, bringing in, incorporating live musicians, I uh, contacted associate Doug Moore. Uh, I had an idea what I want. I want to use guitars, uh, more kind of rock-influenced. Um, so he came by and he laid just the guitar tracks. And what I want to do, the, the buildup of it is that I added layers of guitars. So I kept the melody going. I didn't really change the melody, but the, the arc of it comes from the guitars being layered and layered and layered. Um, and again, it was, I was trying different ideas and I told myself just go back to the basics because sometimes you can overthink what you're trying to do. You can, you know, you've got this technology, so I'm like, well, I'll try this and that, and just sometimes you have to say no. Go back to what you know, go back to playing, go back to being a musician. So we did that, and uh, I really felt it, but when Renee heard it, she, whoa, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. And then I listened again, and um, I kept listening. One time after, no, when you put the, <coughs> the, um, the scene that you wanted, because yeah. we had a scene in we there. We had a scene with it, yeah. Right, when you put it in there and I saw it, I, it, I started getting tearing up. Yeah. It, it was very emotional, yeah. you know? It was really, really got you. Yeah, it was a scene that unfortunately we had to cut out. We didn't spend as much time as we would have liked to and because of the length of the film. And it looked at the decline of Cabrini and specifically the violence against Dantrell Davis, who was a, a young kid who was shot at Cabrini on his way to work or to school. school yeah, yeah, and and the scene was very, very moving, and it gave me goosebumps too. Yeah, it was it was good. So we had to condense that, but then it was like, well, this is a really powerful piece of music. Mm -hmm. Where do we use it? And it was a natural that it would be at the yeah. end. Yeah, it's, I'm really uh, proud of the piece, yeah. how it uh, came together. Yeah. Okay, so let's roll this one. Sure. I love Cabrini. <laughs> it will forever be my home whether I'm here or not. It will forever be my home whether I'm here or not. Cabrini Green will always be getting repped. Cabrini Green will always be getting repped. 
represented no where by I'm me. At. Whether I'm famous, no matter where rich I'm or poor, at. whether I'm famous, I will always rich or poor, Green, because this is I will I always rep Cabrini Green because this is what I can. Here comes another layer of guitars. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, the narrative arc of that song almost replicates a community because mm -hmm. it starts off and it builds and builds and in the end it kind of just decays. Right. You know, with the reverb at the end. And I, I, I just, yeah. Can you guys talk a little bit about your process of working together? Mm -hmm. I think that's, we're, we're constantly trying to encourage our students to work with composers because yes. mm -hmm. it really adds a completely new level to the yeah. film. And it's something that a lot of people are not used to doing. Yeah. And so can you talk a little bit about how you initially started working together and then over the years how you developed a shorthand of working together? Yeah. Well, you know, um, Renee was, you know, she knew what she wanted. She knows what she wants. And uh, knows how to communicate it to me very well. Because um, I, I just, I just kind of listen because a lot of filmmakers, you know, that work with since I worked with Renee, because she was the first one, mm -hmm. they have an idea and they try to talk to you in musical terms, but they don't know music, you know. So you got to kind of, kind of really listen. You got, you know, listen and you know don't try to over, you know, because you know all this stuff, you know. Go well, well what do you, you know, listen to them, you know. And ask them for ideas or point out different references. And Renee was really good at that. She gave me references to listen to and um, things like that. So I was able to, to figure out what she was talking about. And by the time we worked on 70 Acres, you know, we had actually worked on um, another film, A Day another in the film. Forest, that we did Day with in the forest, Lori yeah. Little and Sri Nalamutu. Yeah. So we had, we, you know, we kind of knew how to, you know, the synergy, you know. So when we got to 70 Acres, again, a lot of the cues that I was sending her, because what I do is she would have a, a particular scene, and I would cut that scene out. And I would, you know, I would use QuickTime Pro to do it. It's simple, like set your points, bam, you got your cue. Um, I would throw it into my sequencer, which I would use either Pro Tools or Cubase, and I would write a sketch to that and then send her Mm -hmm. that film with the music on it. But the main thing, once we had all of those parts, I put everything in the timeline and sent her the whole film mm -hmm. with the music in it so that we could see, you know, the how things were working mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. you did know? you guys have a, like a spotting session? Like, did you sit down and talk about where you might want to have music or was it more organic than that? No, I think yeah, we, we did. We told you kind of or what scenes we think. But you music. came by the studio. Yeah, yeah we sat and down. We sat down and um, she bought me a box of ginger snaps. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we sat and we watched everything and yeah, she gave me about, points. Yeah. And I, right there, actually, our first time we sat down with it, I started thinking of uh, blues yeah. with this, you know, blues, jazz. Um, and at the time, it was funny, I was listening to Isaac Hayes' Shaft, and there was a cut on there called Soulsville. Listen to that cut, because again, when I was thinking of Soulsville, I was getting into this film, I'm like, wow, yeah. 
So I was getting that inspiration, you know, mm -hmm. to what I'm going to do, but my way, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So we did. We had a spotting mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. And you came by again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So his kid came by a few times um, to see, you know, like, again, where we're at, mm -hmm. what we need to do, uh, what we need to change, you know. And that was really helpful for me. Right. Very helpful. And then there's scenes, some scenes where you compose. There was one scene where people were dancing to the song, The Cupid Shuffle, and we weren't able to get any rights for that. So you yeah. completely rewrote the song. It's very similar, and you right. called it The Chicago Shuffle. Right. And it's the scene where people are stepping, and you, you kept the same movement and the beat and right. the everything. So. And I don't know how I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was the one. <laughs> but... You know, the way that the music is programmed, when they're moving, the music it's is great. right there. Yeah. Again, I don't, you know, it's one of those things you, when you're doing enough, <laughs> you know, you figure out, okay, you don't want to write a piece of music and it's all sync of people are dancing. Mm -hmm. You want to kind of get it in there, even though more often than not, when they're actually filming scenes like that, you know, it's two separate scenes. Yeah. The people are dancing to something else, <laughs> you, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they're going to, you know, you use, you use sync music and try to get it yeah. right, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, I just sat down and, you know, put it together. That was actually one of the first things I did. Yeah. One yeah. of the first, that in 2009. Yeah. And, again, something that she wanted to keep, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so some of the scenes... Um, we wanted music over, and some we had to have music, like right. the ones where there was incidental music, and we couldn't, we didn't have the license to use that. And right. So, yeah, you were great at that. And there was one scene we didn't use, but we wanted something like "Hit the Road Jack," and so oh, you yeah. did something that was sort of you could tell it was "Hit the Road Jack," but we wouldn't get sued. So, right. <laughs> yeah. And the lesson I learned from doing that, I used to write lots of commercials, and in the Doing commercials and writing jingles, the creative directors can come up with some of the most far-fetched ideas you can imagine. They want, we want country western here sounding like hip-hop, sounding like classical. They know they want that. You know, again, they don't particularly know how to communicate music, but they know right. what they want. Right. So you have to put it together. Yeah. And everything, and you got to point out, well, here's the classical, here's the hip-hop. And here's this, you know, and that's how you make it work. So writing commercials for years has given me a good sense of doing that because mm -hmm. a lot of the commercials are based on popular songs that are out at the time that mm -hmm. they want to promote their product sounding mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Now, did you guys have conversations about specific scenes, like what you, as a filmmaker, were trying to maybe elope yeah. the scene and how yeah. the music would do that? Yeah, especially the scenes that show the decline. Again, I didn't want it cliche, I didn't want heavy-handed, but I wanted something that would still make people feel. And I think that's tricky. I think you did a very nice job with that. Again, um, less is more. Yes. If you can find a good, you know, start a good melody, a good phrase, um, go with that. You'd be surprised if there are any musicians in here. Uh, the Star Wars main theme, how simple it, it really is. It will shock you how simple it is, yeah. <laughs> you know. Should we all sing it now? Should we do it? No. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a good point, too. Like, I think music for film is so undervalued because when it works, you're just... It, you're singing inside, and you don't even know why mm -hmm. you are. And so, um, I never, I never wanted this to be a film where it's where the music was overbearing. You're like, oh, it's another interview with music, like where you noticed it. Right. But it, it's just enough in the subconscious that it moves you through emotionally, and I think that works. Like you do notice the music, but it's not overpowering. Right. Yeah. And go ahead, I'm no, sorry. no, 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 please. And again, <laughs> that comes from the fact that um, with this particular film of working with it over time. You know, really having the time to, I, I felt like I got to know the people because I worked on it for yeah, so long. Yeah. When I actually met them, I'm like, I already know you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I sat there and watched it over and over and over again. You know, I would sometimes, you know, just like lay down in my studio and let it play so that I could really feel what was going mm -hmm. on. I think it's an interesting choice that you made to bring in the live musicians for the second film because it created this musical community and that was just a strong theme in the mm -hmm. films was that it was about community and I think that the 
the added instrumentation really reflects that. Well, not, not only that, I had heard over the years and reading and listening to other musicians, you know, as far as they talk about film, and they were always they would always say you need to have that live, you know, live musicians in there. And I was thinking, well, you know, I can, I can program, you know, with my sequences. I, I played bass on my sequence, and bass players thought it was a bass player. So I'm like, no, I don't need that. But it doesn't cut through as good. You need that live element in there. So now I believe it because I, I've done it. You know, so yeah, it needs that live element. Do you guys have any advice for filmmakers who are st just starting out working with composers of maybe what not to do? <laughs> oh, what not to do. I have one. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few, but what not to do? One of the main things I always say, because a lot of, you know, some of my peers, they want to do it. And, you know, Unfortunately, you know, for some of the documentaries, the budgets are small. So they think, well, you know, they want to get, you know, paid more money or something like that. And I tell them, like, you know, if you take a job and you take it for $100, give them a thousand percent of what you're trying to do, you know, just because that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, as a musician, I mean, I've been fortunate as a musician that I've, you know, covered certain plateaus. I've been very lucky, you know. But, uh, you, you know, do it for the love of it. Do it for the love. Don't do it for the money, you know, because you'll never be happy, <laughs> you know. You'll never be happy. And specifically in terms of your relationship working together, like in, in that, that director-composer mm -hmm. relationship, is there any sort of pitfalls to avoid or... Maybe so. No, I, th I think you need to be as honest as you can, and that's what's great with Dwayne. Mm -hmm. You could write something, and I could be like, I don't like this piece, but I like that, please. Right. And you never got defensive. Yeah. And we went through a lot of different variations of stuff. And oh, yeah. So I think as a young, or not, just filmmaker starting out, just be honest. And, and it's like a, any relationship. You've got to have the right fit. Does it feel good? Can Does you talk to good? that person? Can they talk to you? Do you like them? You, and... It may not be the first composer that you work with. It might be somebody else. I don't know. But you have to feel a sense of comfort because you are going to be, I mean, working together, collaborating, right. and speaking up to make something better. Right. So, yeah, she's exactly right. And don't, you know, don't get offended when it, it's not right. Yeah. You know, if it's not right, it's just not right. And you it know? will be. It will, yeah. it will get there. Sometimes, you know, you could write the greatest piece and go, oh, this is great. They're yeah. going to love it. They go, I don't <laughs> like it, you know. And... You go, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, and figure out what's not working, yeah. you know. But you can't do that if you're pissed off because they just didn't like what you just did. I'm angry <laughs> now. I don't want to work on it no more, you know. Right. And then for filmmakers, if you can be as specific, it's pretty hard. But I, that's why I did listen to a lot of music and sort of identified I like this kind of sound. That always helps a composer if you can. So Great. We're going to open up to questions in just a minute, but um, if you guys have questions, there's going to be a mic over there. So if you want to start lining up, and I'm, as you guys are coming up, I'm going to ask one more question just to fill the little gap. But please come up and ask questions. So in terms of uh, working on the first film that we saw and, mm -hmm. and this film, what were you setting out to do differently in the second film? I know the story continues, and there mm -hmm. was so much more, but what was... Like, what made you know you weren't done and what were you trying to accomplish with the second film? I wanted to show the context. I didn't have a chance to put in the history, so I really wanted people to understand why Cabrini Green was being demolished and, and the racism and the segregation and the classism that happened in Chicago. I thought that was just very important, and it was something that would take took longer than I was able to do for the first film. And also follow the trajectory of the... Because when we first started, they, everything was just initially coming down. So I wanted to follow the completion of the demolition. So since most people who haven't seen the mm -hmm. second film, can you, can you just give us a status of what is still remaining of Cabrini? So there's the row houses that I mentioned that they were created in 1942. They are still there. There's 146 row houses that are still occupied. And there's about 500 row houses that are sort of boarded off and they're unoccupied. And they, those, I think, will become mixed income housing. And I believe 
that so far there was a lawsuit settled. It's not clear what's happening to the 146 row houses, but right now it seems like they're safe. They're going to still be there. People don't realize that there is a still a bit of Cabrini that is left, and those are that's what remains of Cabrini Green. And we see that with um, in the trailer we saw. We met Shaq, who was one of the main. Yeah. Uh, yeah. people in the second film and he's in one of the row houses he's, is, or is, he, is he still since he's in filming? one of the row houses and I, I think too when I was making Vo Voices of Cabrini there was a movement to save Cabrini Green and to stop the demolition and by the end of the second film you know the movement to stop the demolition that didn't succeed but I think what's important and what I wanted to focus on is how do we talk to each other you know now we have a mixed income community for better or worse it's here how do we talk between race and class? How do we dialogue? How do we cut through the barriers and the barricades? And that made that was very important. So, so the second film is divided into sections, just like Voices of Cabrini. And so we go into the history, the the sort of decline of Cabrini, and then also the uh, mixed income community and the dialogue. Great. We have a question. Hi. Thank you all um, so much. And I love what you said about like the confluence of. Um, the bad, but also like the strength of community and the and the warmth, mm -hmm. and I think that's like very much prevalent today in, in so many communities on the south and west sides. Um, and I'm just curious, like, what can we learn from Cabrini to apply to how we sort of approach change in in some of these places on the south side today? Oh, that's a hard question. Mm. And what can we learn? I think we can always learn our history and have compassion for why things are the way they are. I think at Cabrini there was a lot of them people, those people, there was a lot of blame on residents when a lot of it was systemic and structures that, that as Chicago Housing Authority that wasn't um, maintaining the buildings. So I think it's just looking beyond blaming people and looking at what are some of the systemic structures around what's happening. Hi. Um, as a filmmaker, you said you got about 500 hours of footage. And I can only assume that every single bit of that footage is something, it, if you spent your time on that, that means a lot to you. Mm -hmm. Now, this the next movie, I'm guessing, is not 500 hours long. <laughs> but how do you make that choice as a filmmaker and as a storyteller? I need to have this. Unfortunately, I shouldn't put. I, I can't put this in, or I, I. It just seems like a really hard, like tug of war internally. That's why I always need an editor to help out. But when I'm filming, there's always there's different categories. There's sometimes a scene that's gold, and I know it's in the film. So in Voices of Cabrini, when there was the community, no, it was, it was a meeting with David Tack, the the. Uh, CHIA guy, while we were filming that, I'm like, this is gold, this is in the film. You just feel it and you just know. That's one extreme. Then there's the extreme of you're interviewing and you're like, this is not going to be in the film. It's just, <laughs> it's not working, it's boring, or it's wrong, or it's just not right, or whatever. And then it's all the in the middle stuff that's really hard. And that's where I get, it's just essential to have somebody else help who's, who wasn't there while you were doing all of it. You know, I, I have a pretty good sense now of what I want and what I don't want, and that's just through years of doing it. It also helps to have a, a good sense of what story you want to tell, and then you know whether that kind of fits into your story or not. But it's a hard process with that much footage, and I don't necessarily recommend shooting that much footage. But you know, when you're filming a community that's daily being demolished, you, you know, we kept our cameras running because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think there's also, um, for me in Voices, the scene that jumps out is the scene with Mark and his son. Yeah. Where he's like saying, you know, why, why are you quitting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he has this conversation with him where as he's saying it, it's like he's trying to convince himself mm -hmm. and not his son. And, and, and that's one of those scenes that's just like, as you're filming it, you have to know, like, this is for sure. Gonna yeah. Be in the film. I mean, it's such a strong scene. It's well, such an incredibly emotional moment. And that was an or organic moment where they had just watched some of the, the rushes we had filmed before of them. And I think Trevante just came up with that on his own. And, and just, it was one of those organic moments that you can't script. That, yeah, while I was filming, I was like, I hope the sound is working. I hope the camera, I hope it's in focus. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, but I think it is. Yeah. Great. 
Hi, my name is um, Teron. I'm a grad student here at um, DePaul, um, majoring in um, cinema and uh, di di directing in cinema. Um, I, I first want to say that um, you all's movie was was fantastic. It actually brought back a lot of memories. Um, I grew up um, in the 70s. My father and his sister, they actually lived in the Robert Taylor homes. And I remember visiting there in, in the summers um, you know, when I was out uh, on school break. And I remember it just being a lot of fun. It was just, it was a lot of fun. I don't, I don't remember the drugs or the violence or anything like that. I just have good memories of um, those projects. But um, my question to you all was, um, when you came in to film, was there any um, opposition, since you're not an African American, um, was there any kind of opposition um, from you trying to tell a story um, about African Americans when you're not? And it was mixed, and that's a great question. So when I came in, people were trying to wonder, why is this white girl here with a camera? Because the white people that were at Cabrini were there to buy drugs, social workers, or there was also the young communist group at that time that actually moved in to Cabrini. So I wasn't any of those. <laughs> or maybe the news media. And so I think people were trying to figure out what I was about and what my politics were about. And what helped was that I spent so much time at Cabrini, so I think people understood more that I really, truly wanted to understand what was happening. But there's always that tension, me being a white person filming at Cabrini. There, you know, I'm a black um, filmmaker would tell differently. And I think there were some people, there was one person in particular who was really upset that I showed a playground that was kind of run down. Mm -hmm. And that was hard, but then I had to explain where I'm coming from as a filmmaker, if I show everything great and, and looking beautiful, no one's going to believe the authenticity of the film and, and they're not going to believe what's in there. But I, what I always say is, I hope, you know, people say, are you going to make another film about Cabrini or the near north area? And I say, I feel like I'm done. But if somebody else wants to make one or somebody from the community wants to make one, I'm all for that too because there's so many other voices that need to be heard as well. Oh, thank you for your film. That was really interesting. Um, I've been curious about Cabrini Green since probably good times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm just here because I was interested in the subject matter. I know a couple years ago they had an exhibition at the Chicago Cultural Center. There was supposed to be a new museum that was created for public yeah. housing. And I was wondering if you knew anything about that. Yeah, it's a National Public Housing Museum. And I think it's based in Little Italy, and I don't know if it's how much of it is being, is built right now. I know that they have programs on right now, but they, if you Google them, you can sign up for their mailing list. Yeah. So I think it's in the initial stages of being built. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay, great. I think that that was our last question from the oh. audience. Oh. Uh, somebody else? Go if anybody else go. has questions, feel free. We Someone else we'll we'll be here. There. You can ask us, because. Oh, we can do the light. <laughs> oh, you need the light. It'll be great. Did you, did you follow any of the people ever left <coughs> Cabrini and oh, sorry. see what their life was like? Where did they go and things like that? Yeah, so Mark Pratt, who was in you know, at the end of Voices of Cabrini, he purchased a house on the Chicago South Side. Unfortunately, that, he, that was foreclosed, and he moved about five times looking for safe and affordable housing. It was very hard for him his, with his family to find places that were safe for him. And he finally, they finally, he's at 6100 North Michigan, so, but it took a long time. There was a lot of instability. We also followed uh, the sisters, the Havis sisters, and they were around Washington Park, and they were having a lot of problems with their Section 8 housing because the roof was caving in and the landlord was absent and it was just not livable. And so they were having they're having some tough times too. I think it was just a lot of um, just a lot of more more problems that people were having, and then some people it was just hard to follow because people's phones were disconnected, and some people just got lost through the cracks, and I I didn't know what happened to them anymore. Right. Question. Uh, yeah, mine. Uh, I'm I'm coming at this at a couple different angles because I'm I studied photography at Columbia, but I was also a social worker mm -hmm. who moved here in '73 and worked for about 20 years in social work. Um, when I was working on the projects, which was both Cabrini Green and then Robert Taylor Holmes and the whole strip along uh, the south side, um, 
uh, right along the expressway. The way they were explained to me in, in kind of uh, a logical progression was that poor people were taking up too much room, so they decided to build high rises, put the schools in the middle of the project, and turn them into sort of reservations. Mm -hmm. um, and it, of course, became a very segregated, both economically and racially, uh, situations. And, um, and I was always aware of the fact that there was a sense of community there. I was also aware that it was a long way from an idealistic situation when we were going in. And um, I was working with elderly people, and we were usually trying to <coughs> move people into s to subsidized housing, but that was safer, you know, senior buildings mm -hmm. and so forth, in the neighborhood, but out of the high rises. I'm just wondering, I mean, the issue seems really complex. I'm wondering if you have anything to say in regards to that. Um, there was somebody in the movie that spoke about, you know, I don't want to be put in some sure. integrated housing area right. thinking those white people are, or people who are, I mean, you could, you could do it in Hyde Park, which is an integrated area mm -hmm. in terms of racial balance, but it's not integrated economically. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems like it's a delicate balance there. I mean, if you don't want to have it racially and economically segregated, um, how do you, just how do you solve these these problems. I mean, it just seems segregation, regardless of whether it's economic or racial, seems like a real bad idea. Yeah. It's comfortable, but a bad idea. And I'm just wondering if you've got a, any. I think the on thing that. with the mixed income is it's the range of mixes of income. I think it would be better if mixed income had uh, it, it, what what it is right now is just like low income and then very high income, and there isn't a lot of the middle. And I think if you're going to create a community, make it so that there's more middle. But I agree with you. It's, it's a complex, there's no easy answers. People say to me, well, what's the answer? I don't know. I mean, what is your answer? What is anybody's answer? I think for me what's important is, is the bottom line, too, of how we treat people and which race, which class are privileged in our society and what does it mean to live in a home and what does housing mean. And... Uh, things like the schools that are underfunded. And um, so to me, I try to look at, you know, what is underlying? Like, how did we get here? And what can we learn from this? And what are our core values as a society? You know, the S word, socialism, has such a bad <coughs> connotation. But I lived in Canada, which, you know, had universal health care. And mm. it was a better society. When you were, when, you know, somebody fell down, you could call an ambulance and you didn't have to worry that they didn't have health insurance, and it made it better for everybody. So I always say, you know, when you vote or whatever, think of what kind of society you want to live with. And Bernie will take care of it. Bernie? You all, it's also because I grew up in Vermont, and he was my mayor when I was a teenager. <laughs> and I was in a band, and he gave us some money to uh, play music in this neighborhood on the back of the pic pickup truck. So. <laughs> he was a pretty cool guy. So yeah, I mean, he's one of my influences. And that, you know, to me, those are my, as a filmmaker, that's my underlying message. You know, that's, those are my core values and my beliefs. And that's the, um, when you're a filmmaker, though, th I guess that's the power in a way. This is what you get to say. You get to shape a film how you want it to be. Yeah, and I think um, you guys should all go to the Siskel and see the second film because it's fantastic, so please go. But there's um, one of the things that really struck me, you're talking about this, how there's the very wealthy and the very poor in the yeah. same place, but even just that this, how it was sold to the people of Cabrini, that, that there, there would be these places for them, but the, the rules that they have to live under in order to get into them are so absolutely ridiculous, like mandatory drug testing, and you can't have anyone in your family have any sort of criminal record of any kind, or they can't be on the lease. And there's a wonderful story um, that Deidre uh, tells about her daughter in right. the second film. I don't want to spoil it. You guys should always see it. But that, that I think that was also very misrepresented. And I think that adds to the problem that, that this gentleman was talking about, that in order to solve the problem, it has to be a real solution and not one that just looks good on paper that isn't practical. Yeah, and it might be a solution that does make people uncomfortable. But we got to talk. we got to talk to each other. And they're starting to do that at the Parkside Mixed Income Community, and that, that makes me feel um, more encouraged. The developer is actually trying. Often developers are seen as bad people, but he's, he's trying. And so that gives me hope for the future. We have time for one last question. Um, hello. So I grew up close, really close to Cabrini Green, and still live around there. So I've literally seen the changes um, as I was growing up. 
And as the other gentleman said, um, I definitely experienced sort of it being a fun place, mm -hmm. although we knew it was yeah. sort of also had its problems. I was curious though, because I grew up with this narrative of the Berlin building as this like yeah. amazing example mm -hmm. of people who sort of managed the building right, and we just thought Berlin building was always gonna be there, like it would never go down. And we had heard rumors that like, you know, just all kinds of rumors yeah. that it was a co-op and they developed their own management and their own system for cleaning it up. I mean, so for us, it was this model example of kind of um, how to, you know, make sure that your building isn't closed down. Cause I also grew up in like a low income area. So I'm curious, because you mentioned the Berlin building while yeah. we were talking, and you said it was the last building to close, which yeah. I also was aware of. If you know the story behind that and sort of mm -hmm. why that model, well, at least to us kind of in the area, didn't work. Yeah, and that's great. There's a, a journalist, Ben Austin, and he's writing a book on the Berlin building. So it's 1230 North Berlin, and it, it was uh, a legacy. <laughs> Everything you said is what I heard, too. It was the cleanest building. It was co-op. It was... Uh, tenant managed and run and it shouldn't have been demolished personally and and I think for a while people thought it wasn't going to be demolished really if you're thinking of a functional building that works it's not run down it was Berlin and it, it's again it's another tragedy that it had to go because it did work but you know then the skeptic in me looks at real estate values and and you know market rate folks who are buying near the Cabrini Green high rises. I once went sort of undercover like I was going to buy one of those homes. And I said, oh, will the Cabrini buildings be there? And I was told, oh, no, don't worry. They'll all be gone. And that, to me, is the tragedy of the Berlin building, because it would have been great if it was still there. Yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned it. There. Great. Well, that's all we have time for. I cannot thank you guys enough. This was incredible. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. This was thank wonderful. You. Thank really you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks all of you. Thank you.